Welcome to Caring Community with your host, Jay West. In this community, creative initiatives are welcome. A culture of transformation is normal and miracles are expected. Welcome to Caring Community. Hi, welcome to Caring Community. I'm Jay West. Good to have you here today. And my special guest, Jerry Pascal. Yes. Hi, Jerry. Howdy. How are you? Good. I met Jerry on Facebook, as I recall. Is That's that right. correct? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know who told you to follow me, but we should take them out to eat someday because that was a good, good, good solution, good choice. So, yeah. you know who that was? I think you were a friend of a friend. I've never heard, never remember who the friend was, or I guess it didn't matter. So I guess it didn't matter. Point was, I met you. Yeah. So we met at, and he came to a couple meetings, church services. I was traveling full time then. Uh, he helped us plan our church, um, became a good friend, he's a servant, he's a biker, not a, not a motorcycle biker, but a bicycle biker. You can tell his shorts there and his fancy tennis shoes. And, uh, and he loves the Lord and uh, has a good marriage, he, he's interested in marriage ministry, um, just jack of all trades, he knows he's very talented outside with putting stuff together or refurbishing or mending or fixing my roof or fixing my deck or just he's done a lot of tasks. Anyway, we've been friends for a while and I just thought I'd have you on. Well, thank you. He's a man of few words. Okay, the show's <laughs> over. Thank you for tuning in today. We'll see you next time. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about um, some of your passions. Let's, let's just let's talk about biking first. How did you get into that? When did you first doing that? Okay. Geez, when I had a paper out when I was about 12 years old and I carried the papers in my basket in the back and did that for several years. And so wait, wait, what, what, what is a paper? What, what a paper you, route. I know, what is a paper route for, you know? Oh, we well, they, they do have this thing called newspaper and so you would deliver- Newspaper? Newspaper, yeah, I would deliver newspapers to Everything them. Everything is, is green. No, we don't get any newspapers. You know, yeah, so. well, now I get it electronically, but Electronic, yeah. a lot of people still like that actual paper. So you write, but a lot of kids have a paper route. A lot of kids write at your age, my age, go to school and everything else. They don't hold on to the biking. Mm -hmm. How did that? Because you could do that thing in Iowa. What's that thing in Iowa called? Ragbri. The what? Ragbri. It's Rag actually going on right now, but I'm not on it this year. You're not on it this year. But yeah. you just did a big ride in Colorado, though, right? What was yeah, we that? did a five-day ride on the Great Divide mountain bike route, which is a kind of a back roads, gravel, mostly in low travel highway route. Mostly uphill. A lot of that, yeah. A lot of five days, how many miles did you go? Uh, 240. 200, can you imagine going 240 miles in five days? That's a lot just for a car, much less a bike. You must, you must have really good, I'm not gonna feel it. You must have really good muscles down there. So. Well, I've had a few years of riding, so yeah, I enjoy it. How, do you have to train for this, these kind of things? Yeah, we, a friend of mine and a few friends of mine will train on the um, trails mainly stay away from the roads if possible in most cases and yeah you got to be ready to do some hills that's for sure otherwise you're going to be eaten up pretty much out in Colorado with the places we were. So do you where did you stay along the way? Did you stay at campgrounds or hotels yeah. or where did you stay? We stayed at like three campgrounds and a couple hotels. So who's are you carrying all your supplies on your back while you're riding your bike? We actually had um, my friend Igor from Russia he uh, <clears throat> His fiance um, was a support driver for us, so that was a blessing. And then, uh, so we didn't have to carry that much on our bikes. So how many cycle? How many other guys were with you, or girls, or ladies? What? How many people? Were just us three. So oh, two riders. Three. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. This year, so last I, year it wasn't was a big group. Guy. What's that? It wasn't like in Iowa. It's a big group. Yeah, like right? way bigger. Like in Iowa, how many people were riding? Well, any one day, you could have anywhere from probably fifteen to thirty thousand riders on Ragbri. Okay, and that's town across town. the state. Across the entire state of Iowa, yes. And it, does it always start on the Nebraska side and go the other way? or is it Yes, correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So is it mostly Nebraska people that are in this ride? No, they come from every state. Um, a lot from Iowa, a lot from Nebraska and surrounding states. And how um, long a ride is the Iowa thing? It's a week. It's mm -hmm. a week. And mm -hmm. do you camp along that too? Yeah, they have um, massive campgrounds for people and showers in the high schools and things like that. Wow. Yeah. So it's a big, somebody's got to put that all together. Yeah, the Des Moines Register does it. Um, mm -hmm. Stands for Register. Does annual. every state have one of these rides, or just Iowa? Um, you know, uh, various states do, like Missouri, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, 
Colorado, those are the ones I'm familiar with. I think I'd want a really small state like Rhode Island or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not Texas. Do that Don't one start day. with Texas. Yeah. yeah. So, so you like that kind of thing? Does your wife ever participate with you? Um, she rides, but not as often as she used to. But we're talking about that. We're thinking of an electric bike. Maybe we'll see. Electric bike. Yeah. I've heard of these electric bikes. You don't actually, is, what's the difference between an electric bike and a moped? Not a lot, just mainly in looks. I think a moped has a little more power in most cases, but they're, moped usually is a gas engine, whereas electric is, you know, you ever battery. Wish, do you ever wish you lived in a more warmer state so you could ride all year long? In the winter, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. So biking's one of your hobbies, and you're obviously really good with your hands, putting things together and stuff. It's a spiritual component of yours that that's how we connected. Yeah. So tell me about tell me about the spiritual walk. You know, we were talking about earlier today at our house about some things. How do you how do you personally stay connected to God? Um, I've I guess you know going to church and trying to be around people that um, are doing good with the God thing, and that's one reason I get onto this guy here. Um, but also, um, I think, you know, when I've paid more attention to God and he's led me um, where I've listened, then some great things have happened in my life. Like I've done a, a jail ministry for about 12 years with some other guys. Um, yeah, I forgot about at, the jail ministry. Yeah, the Douglas that. County Jail. Um, mm -hmm. That was good. Um, and I mean, I my, my, met my wife, I think, because of, uh, went through, unfortunately, went through a divorce and in the divorce care course, um, Tony Evans, you know who Tony Evans down in Texas, the mm -hmm. pastor, he said, I remember on the relationship um, week, there's, you know, it's a divorce care course and Christian-based course, and Tony Evans says, he said, um, don't you go trying to find yourself a mate. If you do that, you'll just screw it up. He said, let God find you a mate. So I bought into that, thought that's a good idea, so prayed about that, and that's how I found my wife, Betty. <clears throat> and so... Um, was, was how did you? How did that happen? Was she in? You were in what? Divorce care? Yeah, okay. divorce care at the and church. She was in another kind of care. She actually came to divorce care later. Her and her um, later, and I met her there, and she recognized me from. But UNL. she was in divorce, was she? She actually went through a divorce, but oh, then okay. her, he later passed away. Right. It was okay. it's a long story, but um, okay. yeah. So that was a godly meeting, I'd say, and for sure, and. So I want to say good, blessing. These, these bike rides, I'm just real curious, go back there and then come back here, and we'll go back and forth. Do the bike rides have a spiritual component to them? Is there like... I guess we talk, I mean, I guess we talk about Christian stuff and with the guys I'm with, they're all Christians, and so we learn from each other on, we have talks while we're riding, and so I guess in that respect, but it's not like a formal how, organized so deal. Is, how do you talk while you're riding? I mean, like, do you have headsets and you're talking back and forth? I usually and, use my mouth. Oh, just use your mouth. You can yeah. talk and hear. Okay. No. It's hard to well, have actually, a lot of times pedaling. you can't. Yeah, you can't be talking. But like on trails, we could be next to each other or close by each other and talk. Or if, if it's not too windy, be behind each other, you can hear each other if you're not too far away. So, yeah, we have some really good conversations on the bike rides, and then we'll stop and have coffee or something or a meal and talk then. So, is there any parallel between? Biking with a bunch of guys or ladies. I don't know. I imagine there's ladies riding in these yeah, big things, too. On occasion. Okay. Yeah. Is there any parallel between kind of the camaraderie, team effort on the bikes and marriage? Um, on marriage? Boy, well, Put you on the I think we, we there, I guess we talk a lot about marriage, I guess, is the biggest thing. And like the lessons we've learned each other um, and what can help the other guy in their marriage or... Right. Let, you know that kind of a thing, and or maybe a Christian basis on it, or um, to get feedback and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I know that you marriage ministry has always been something we've talked about, something you enjoy helping other people. They're in the throes of a difficult situation, crisis, mm -hmm. you know, arguments, whatever. Um, what What did you learn from your first marriage? that didn't work, obviously it failed, and then what have you learned from your second marriage that would be helpful to people? Um, well, I guess the communication aspect and having some of the skills that we didn't have in our first marriage, um, when I went through that divorce, I gave me a lot of passion for marriage, I guess, so that it, w it could be done right. And so I started checking up on that and learning about different ministries and taking a course called PrEP, which is available electronically, uh, 
which stands for Prevention and Relationship Enhancement Program. It's a really good course, science, you know, studied. Uh, so let's say it's PREP and it's called what? Give us the acronym for it. Uh, Prevention and Relationship Enhancement Program Okay. at the University of Denver Center for Marital and Family Studies. Um, a couple of professors there perfected this and it reduces the divorce rate 50%. You can take a course on it online. E-PREP it's called, by the way. What's the E um, stand for? Uh, I think electronic prep. In other okay. words, it's a, you can do, it's like a webinar Got it. almost Got it. that you okay. can listen. And then, um, so then I, and then I, at the church I was at at the time, I helped start a, um, a mentoring, marriage mentoring ministry through getting some mentoring for myself and how to do it from Brookside Church, um, the Friesens. Um, and they're still doing it today at their um, so hobby marriage, farm. Marriage mentoring, like M&Ms, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so marriage mentoring is just very effective. Um, in its, in its success, and um, so I'm a big believer in that. In fact, Waters Edge United Methodist Church is using it to this day um, that I helped start that out there. So, um, yeah, I'm a big believer in that. So what do you think is, if you had to say, what's the top two pitfalls for newly married people to, to avoid? What are, what are the, what are the, what are the, um, what are issues that people, if, they, if they've dealt with them in advance, it would help prolong their marriage after they get married? Uh, good question. Um, I would say one of the big things is um, inability to handle conflict and learning about how to deal with um, communication and conflict. I mean, a lot of people come from families, um, backgrounds where there's been a lot of yelling or conflict, and so that's just what they, they're familiar with. So right. the e-prep can help with that a lot. Um, where you actually get a more comfortable situation to deal with issues, um, learn the skills, how to deal with those. And so it really can help the marriage a lot. And then, let's uh, see, so the conflict. Um, and of course the money thing is right. one of the big ones in marriage. And I guess just um, having good discussions on that before you're getting married and, and making sure that um, there's no secrets and the, that, um, uh, one thing I heard from, I guess this relates to money too, one thing I heard from a, uh, was it a pastor, who was it? Um, no, it was a medical doctor. Uh, he would have uh, couples come into him often um, together, not just the one, to get their medical appointment. And he would start asking, uh, actually as a female, start asking them, well, wh what do you attribute your good marriage to? Because you know, they're coming in together. And they said, well, we never, we never make a decision without consulting my spouse first. And I, I, the more I thought about that, it's like, wow, that's really impressive. Not that you have to, every little dinky thing, but really um, it can impact your spouse, so it's good to ask them, you know, get their approval, make sure they're on board with it so that you don't cause hard feelings and stuff. And it's a good you know, rule to go by. I was married, you know, for almost 42 years, and of course Diane passed away 18 months ago now, but our kind of rule of thumb in our, with finances was, if it costs under $100, we don't have to ask. That's it's good. Just somebody, yeah. If it was over hundred dollars, you know, it was clothing or whatever. It's hundred dollars. Say, okay, check for the other person. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was just kind of our barometer, if you will. And yeah. of course, Diane wasn't much of a shopper, so it really didn't fall to her that often anyway. But um, that was just something we did. That doesn't mean it's the best thing, you know. But uh, hundred dollars or less, eh, just go ahead and get it. You know, you can. If the other one's adamantly opposed to it, you. Can always take it back unless you bought it at. You know, goodwill or from a garage sale or something. Yeah. So it's not that big of an issue. Um, for somebody else, $100 might be a lot. Maybe it'd be $20, you know. Mm. And another family got, oh, $100, nothing. I could do $500, you know. But yeah. I think it's determining, kind of setting some patterns or parameters or borders, uh, whatever term you want to use in terms of discovering. You know, and you mentioned about arguing too. You know, I came from a family where my parents argued, and even though they stayed married, they, they argued, they, the, when the family got to, extended family got together on either side, my mom's side, my dad's side, they argued. It was just an, it was just an environment of, of arguing a lot. Yeah. And so when we had a family reunion later on after, you know, a big, big, big family reunion uh, out in, out in uh, uh, North Carolina, or was it Pennsylvania? I guess it was Pennsylvania the first time. Anyway, I was like super apprehensive. I didn't want to go because I was concerned. All these cousins, nephews, 
nieces, they're all going to argue. Yeah. Well, second generation, they didn't argue. It was oh. really weird. We got there, it was totally peaceful, it was calm, it didn't happen. And we all kind of had the same experience growing up. We all had our parents who, they, you know, my dad's side especially, well, even my mom's side. Lots of brothers and sisters get together, fight, 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 fight. And I was like, I don't want to go to that. Yeah. But I was so blessed when I got there, second generation, they didn't fight. Yeah, one thing I learned about that is some people like to argue and, right. and some people just hate to be around right. conflict. So, and I was going to say the other thing, um, um, when I lost my train of thought, the, um, oh, with checking with your spouse about, you know, checking with them before you do things, it's not just money, it's like golf or going to golf or doing, spend time with friends or right. whatever. I mean, it's just a good idea to do that. Um, or even inviting somebody over after you did, went golfing or played tennis. Yeah. And then walk in with your spouse and your spouse is thinking you're just coming home and you come in through two of your friends and they don't know about it. You know, just creating, I guess, just common courtesy. Mm -hmm. Hey, is it old? Call them up and say, hey, uh, had a great time golfing, playing tennis today. Uh, can we come over and cook some burgers or whatever? Yeah. And uh, just, you know, checking signals, making sure they're okay with that, make sure the house, they feel comfortable with the house, you know. Yeah. And it can work both ways. You know, ladies can have people over, they went to some gathering, tea or whatever, and they hey, I want to have my friends over. I said, well, how do you feel about that, you know? And I think just asking questions, keeping communication open, you know? And if, you know, and obviously we're Christians, so we believe in keeping God in the communication too, you know, and that's a big, uh, I, you know, having just gone through grief share, and because Diane died and everything else, I don't know how people deal with major crisis without God. Yeah, really. Me I, too. I, just, I just don't know how they do it. And, and they, they do it, but I don't know how they do it. Because I find such peace. I've got my Bible here on the platform. I always bring it to the shows in case you want to read it, you know, or something, share something. And I believe the Word of God is powerful and brings us comfort. And I, I, I put this quote on Facebook the other day um, regarding grief uh, or mourning. Uh, if you run to God when you're mourning, you get comfort, okay? But if you run away from God when you're mourning, you go into unbelief. Mm. And it's just interesting, a lot of people make comments about that because uh, it, says, it says in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Right. So you got to do it with God. Because a lot of people say, well, mourning's not, grieving's not in the Bible. Yes, it is. Jesus said it in the Beatitudes. He said you're blessed if you do it. So um, I... And again, that's off the subject a little bit, but just saying, hey, whatever you're going through, let's bring God into the conversation and pray, um, ask him. Uh, you, you and I have had discussions about prayer and intercession and hearing from God. And, and um, what's, what's the best way for you to hear from God? In your, in your walk, you've been walking with God for quite a while. Um, it took me a long time to learn this, but being around the, the people that that mentored me on this partly, but just, you know what I do is, um, when I need to help, the help of God for decisions and things like that, I'll get in my easy chair, and I'll kick back a little bit, and I just be quiet and ask God to speak to me with a, some sign or picture or stop, red light, yellow light, green light, um, a verse. Um, and it's not like I always hear from him, but a lot of times I do, and I can usually tell I've heard the same thing from other people. It's like, you're not sure sometimes it's from God, but a lot of times you can tell, yeah, I think that's from God, you know. Right. And so a lot of times he will come at those times, but until you s slow down and listen, it's, it doesn't happen too well. Right. What's, what's the key to listening for you? Um, being intentional about doing it. I don't do it enough in enough areas of my life, and uh, we just had to talk about that today, as a matter of fact, but... Um, I think just, yeah, just being quiet and intentional and confessing sins before you do that even so there's no barrier between you and God and things like that. Uh, right. I don't know if there's any one key, but um, just stopping and taking the time and being intentional. Yeah, and sometimes it's just intentional about hearing from God. It's just being quiet. You know, we live very busy lives. Technology, social media, television, uh, podcasts, you know, you name it, we are bombarded with information. Information, information, information. And yet, it's the Bible, we believe, is what brings us transformation. And you gotta be in tune with God. You gotta listen, you gotta spend time. You know, a lot of people pray and they do all the talking. 
Yeah. You know? And they say amen and they go on their way. Well, how about listening? How about how to pad a paper with a pencil or pen and then just jot down your impressions, your thoughts? You know, it might be from God, might not, but it's, at least it's a place to start. And uh, just some quiet time. I think it's Psalm 46 that says, be still and know that I'm God. Right. And there's, 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 a time, there's a time to dance and there's a time to rejoice and there's a time to be quiet and there's a time to just sit still. And all that is important. And to block out the noise and the distractions. You know, I have, in my house, you've been in my house, you help me stay in my deck. That's one of our areas. You know, like to sit out there, we have a fountain, it's quiet for the most part. Occasionally you hear a dog, occasionally you hear some children, but it's really quiet. Listen to that fountain, just pray. It's peaceful, I got some evergreen trees, I got flowers, it's, it's a nice environment to just relax, kick back. Like yeah. you said, the easy chair for me, the easy chair is my garden. And yeah. you know, find, that, find that place of solitude for you. Find that place where you can commune with God. Find that place that you can allow the Lord to speak to your heart. I mean, our mind is filled with stuff, yeah. you know. And so, you know, we have like five minutes left. Um, there's so many aspects about marriage. And remember, you, you said, what am I going to talk about? Well, we, you know, we always talk about mm -hmm. this. So if you had to give advice for somebody who's, let's say, not somebody starting out in marriage, but let's say somebody who's in a marriage, maybe not a crisis, but a difficult situation. You know, there's tension. What advice would you give them? Well, a lot of times tension is going to be, you know, um, und undiscussed uh, bitterness or resentment. And I know that e-prep course helps with deal dealing with those. Um, maybe there's a bad pattern of not bringing up concerns, and, but that prep course helps you learn how to, to uh, share those things and how you feel about it, because no one can argue with your feelings, you know. Um, but um, tension, I guess, I guess having more constant communication when things come up. One thing ePrep teaches you is once a week you should have a, a brief talk about, you know, any concerns or whatever. Um, that way if you didn't deal with it yesterday or last night, then you got Sunday where you have your weekly meeting to deal with it because you can fall back and right. deal with it then. It's, it's a good thing. So, but, I mean, the key, key thing is, you know, being there, you're there for to be um, a servant for the other person, and, and, and you need to realize that um, going both ways, you know, that's a good attitude to have to make the marriage work. Um, I really like and that. And commitment. Being, being a servant, you know, not just being served, but being a servant and being willing to just get up and even to, to the point of inconvenience, to the, if you really love them, to the point of inconvenience, it's not what you had planned for, it's not your schedule, but it's to, the, you know, and helping somebody else. You know, as you were talking, I just realized, um, as, we're, as we're recording this, it's near the end of July, but in August, August 27th, at King of Kings, I'm doing a seminar with Pastor uh, Leroy Gurner on prayer for special relationships. And he's doing family, and I'm doing marriage. We're doing other relationships, too, like how to pray for somebody who's in conflict, how to pray for somebody who's in financial difficulty, a friend, how to pray for a friend to get saved, and so on, lots of different avenues. But just praying for marriages. And um, I teach, and I'm just going to share it right now. I teach, pray before you make love. Uh, it'll change. I just met with a man who is addicted to porn. His wife found out about it, and uh, is this big, big mess. And I said, you start praying before you make love, and you'll start praying for that your wife as you're making love, and all these porn issues are going to disappear because God's going to do a supernatural work in your life. And I really believe that, that. And a lot of people don't teach that, but I do because it says to pray unceasingly. Hmm. But we don't talk about pr that aspect of prayer. Hmm. And so um, uh, I did that with Diane, and I believe it's, it's helpful. Uh, and we started it by, kind of by accident. We started because 10, 12 years in our marriage, we were waiting for children, so we started praying for children, and, which, you know, Jason is that child. But then we continued it after Jason was born. And so we pray one for another. Before you make love and it's like wow nobody talks about that nobody says that that's true but it's a good thing it's a good thing and honestly you want your mate to have a great time i'm not being graphic <clears throat> you know i'm just saying god created sex okay 
And right. it's okay to talk about it. And it's okay to um, share these kinds of insights and helping couples in their prayer walk, in their life, in their mutual companionship, caring one for another, loving one another. Yeah. And so, um, not trying to embarrass anybody, <laughs> just saying, you might consider it, you might consider it. Go out on a limb, you know, hmm. and uh, take a step of faith, take a leap of faith. So, hey, thanks for coming on the show. It was easier yeah. than you thought, right? Yeah, So, Jerry's a good friend, and uh, uh, he, uh, he just, a guy that I look up to and I admire. Uh, I've watched his walk with God since about maybe 2010, so 12 years now. And, um, you know, ups and downs, like we all do. Oh, I've had my ups, I've had my downs. Um, but consistency, consistency, going back, going back. You talk about faithfulness, consistency is also good too. So, anyway. Uh, I think we're close to the end, so thanks for tuning in to Caring Community Day. My good friend Jerry Pascal. Uh, we should have had we should have had Betty on here too. We should have had her with you. <laughs> so she's probably too shy for that. But anyway, thanks for tuning in to Caring Community, and uh, we'll catch you again soon in the next show. God bless you. See you then. Bye bye.